Let's say it together. This is my Bible. This is God speaking to me. My eyes are open. My heart is prepared to receive all of God's promises and instructions. Today I make my Bible the final authority in my life so that in every circumstance I will bear good fruit and others will see Christ in me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, today we're going to continue um, with the message, Once We Know, with part two, and I only have part two. There is no part three. Um, But anyways, with part two, last week um, I shared with you that as I was seeking God for something personally, um, I came across this statement um, that says, affliction and persecution doesn't come to teach you something. Affliction and persecution comes because you have been taught something. And that really stuck with me, so I began to study it out. And the more I thought about it, um, it made me think about how we judge people because of their behavior. So a parent may say, if you're good, I'm going to give you this. We tie their behavior to a reward. And so as I was thinking about that, I was thinking, why is it? that affliction and persecution would happen to Christians? Why is it that we would go through something? Um, Why is it that all these things keep happening to me? Well, Minister Erica, in her message, um, Committed to Be Content, mentioned a few lies that the church have been told. Do you remember that? And one of the lies uh, she read was that Christians are supposed to be rich. Uh, Funny enough, a lot of people think Christians are supposed to be poor. Um... Christians aren't supposed to suffer, or if there's an affliction or a persecution, it's because you did something wrong. And, you know, I was thinking about that, and I was like, well, if God, if somebody was sick, and and you approached them and said, you must have did something, you must have not forgiven somebody, you must be holding on to some bitterness, that made me think about, if God put a sickness on somebody for something they did, that would contradict the whole message of grace and who God is. Because if that's the case, none of us would be, none of us deserve to be saved. So that got me thinking that there has to be something to this, that affliction and persecution don't come to teach us something, but it comes because we've been taught something. So we walk through Mark uh, chapter 4, in particular, verse 1 through 26, and we read about how no matter how little or how much you know the word, the enemy is right there to steal it. And many times in the form of affliction and persecution. Not because you need to learn a lesson, but because you have been taught something that the enemy now wants to steal. And so we read and left off pretty much at, um, I'm going to read Mark 4.24. That says, And he said to them, Be careful what you are hearing. The measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you, and more besides will be given to you to hear. So the more you study and focus on the truth, the correct knowledge of God, the more virtue and knowledge will come back to you. Well, at the same time, the more you know, the more the enemy is going to fight you. Because you know more. It's really easy for a new believer to kind of have a cakewalk, you know, may get banged up once or twice. They don't know much. But you take somebody who has been in the Word for quite some time, who has been raised in the Word, uh, and don't let it be a tongue-talking, going-in-the-war-room person. Don't think the devil's not going to try to knock on your door. And he's going to have to fight harder because you know a little bit more for him to steal. Well, The measure of fruit or the measure of virtue or knowledge that you get, what type of virtue or knowledge do we get to stand against this affliction? And that's where we left off. So I would like for you to turn with me to 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter 1, and if you don't mind, I'm going to read it in the Amplified Version because I think if we're going to be afflicted and persecuted because what we know, don't you think it's important to know how to deal with that? So we don't lose the battle. So here in in Peter, Peter is actually speaking to those Christians who have fallen prey to the Roman Empire. 
And this is a commentary say that he was giving instructions, almost the kind of instructions like a father who's getting ready to die giving instructions to his son. And he's saying, this is so important, you need to pay attention to this. I need you to pay attention to this. So verse 2, 2 Peter 1, 2 says, May grace, God's favor and peace. And I love that the Amplified gives you this definition. Peace which is perfect, well-being, all necessary good, all spiritual prosperity, and freedom from fears, agitating passions, and moral conflicts. Could you imagine living that kind of peace? Free from moral conflicts, agitating passions. You know, we get agitated with each other. They're passionate about their opinion, and, and they're more vocal about their agitation. Wouldn't it be nice to be free from that? So he's saying, may God's grace, favor, and peace, all of those things be multiplied to you in the full, personal, precise, and correct knowledge of God, of Jesus our Lord. Correct knowledge. See, we're only going to grow in virtue if we grow in correct knowledge. Remember in Mark, it said, the study and the measure that you give to the truth will be the same measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back. So if you're not studying correct knowledge, you're not going to get much virtue back. We only grow if we meditate on the truth. Verse 3, for his divine power has bestowed upon us all things that are uh, requisite and suited to life and godliness through the full and personal knowledge of him who have called us uh, by and to his own glory and excellence. See, everything we need for life or godliness, we have in him. Everything we need in life, we have in him. Not your hard work, not your popularity, not your fame. Everything you need for life or godliness is found in him. Verse 4. By means of these, he has bestowed to us his precious and exceedingly great promises, so that through them, them meaning through those great promises, you may escape by flight from moral decay, rottenness and corruption that is in the world because of covetousness, lust and greed, and become share partakers of the divine nature, in essence meaning bearing fruit. That in his promises, you are able to escape moral decay, moral conflict, corruption, lust, greed, And in his promises, you are able to bear fruit. How do you know about his promises? You have to study correct knowledge. And without correct knowledge, you're unable to bear fruit. Remember last week we talked about that some of us, the word gets choked because of greed and covetousness. But if we were focusing on the promises, we wouldn't give prey to greed and covetousness. So we think the fame and, oh, if I could just be so famous and people want my autograph, that that's going to do something. That's only going to lead to more covetousness. It's only going to lead to more lust. Verse 5. For this very reason, and this is where it gets juicy. For this very reason, I read verse 4, okay. Adding your diligence to the divine promises employ every effort in exercising your faith to develop virtue for this reason what reason verse 4 says to avoid moral corruption covetousness greed and lust so for this reason if we don't want to have the word sowed to us that falls on ground that gets choked away from us because of greed and covetousness and the things of this world, the desires of the world, for that reason, if we don't want that, this is what we have to do. Do you want to know what we have to do? If you don't want that, this is what we have to do. We have to employ every effort in exercising faith to develop virtue. Employ every effort. You have to make an effort to exercise your faith. How do you exercise your faith? Pastor Grady said it this morning. Yeah, Come to church. Fellowship. If you don't know the word, this is a great place to learn it. 
Come to church, fellowship, read your Bible, pray. Communicate with somebody who knows the word. Don't go run to your friends who don't because they're not going to sell you correct knowledge. They're going to give you knowledge that is really only going to lead to more covetous. I know we need to make that paper, girl. We need to make that paper. (laughs) Not, girl, we just need to eat this chocolate cake and trust God. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) All right. When life gets hard, eat cake. You know what I'm saying? And trust God. Eat cake and trust God. Now he says, employ every effort in exercising your faith to develop virtue. Well, what's faith? What is faith? We taught on that. What is faith? The word. So we have to employ every effort to learn the word so that we can develop virtue. The the definition, we say virtue. That sounds good. Virtue. You need to have virtue. We need to walk through these circumstances with virtue. What is virtue? What is virtue? We have the definition up here for you. Virtue is behavior showing high morals or moral excellence. What's interesting when you look this word up It gives you another definition that says someone who has virtue makes biblical choices in life. Someone that has virtue makes biblical choices in life, which means you make choices that line up with the word. You make choices that line up with correct knowledge. And the more correct knowledge you know, the more virtue you receive. See, our faith is the word. It supplies moral excellence, which is the foundation of our pursuit of virtue. We can't have virtue without knowing the word. We can't have virtue without knowing correct knowledge. And when we pursue virtue, we naturally pursue correct knowledge. They go hand in hand. That's why Jesus said, the measure of of the thought and study you give to the truth will be the measure of virtue and knowledge. You can't have one without the other. You can't have knowledge and no virtue or virtue and no knowledge. They work together. So the more you study this, the more virtue and knowledge is going to come back. The key word here is develop. Develop means to grow or to cause to grow. So you have to grow in the knowledge which means to grow, you have to exercise your faith. And to exercise your faith, you have to exercise the word. And to exercise the word, you grow in knowledge. And you grow in knowledge, you all of a sudden have virtue. You see that? Now remember, last week, when Jesus spoke to the crowds, the ones who didn't want to know true knowledge left. And the few who stayed got more knowledge. Right? So we need to take our cue from Jesus. He didn't waste his breath on people who didn't want to know. Now, it's not saying we have to be rude. We need to walk in love. But we don't need to have useless conversations with people who don't want to have eyes to see or ears to hear. Jesus didn't spend his time. Why should we? He sowed into those who wanted to know the truth. You'll know the difference. There's a difference between people who are defiant that are just going to debate what you know because they don't believe it and they like hostility. And there's a difference from somebody who doesn't necessarily believe it. They want to know, but they're a little like, you know, they're trying to test you, but they really want to know. You'll, if you're in the word, you'll know the difference. And like Jesus, he just, you know, those who want to know, I'm about to explain it to you. Those who don't, let them go. Don't become ungodly by your conversation because you get agitated about your passion, even if it is for Christ. You still become agitated. We see that now. Political campaigns. We see political camp, political campaigns. They're not the only ones acting crazy. Christians talking about it are acting crazy. We can't even talk about it in peace because we agitated. <laughs> not in the word. Verse 6. In exercising knowledge. Now, exercise. You know what exercise is? So you think of exercise. You think of physical exercise, right? Okay, well, it is activity that requires physical movement, or it's the putting to use or the application of something. So think of it that way. In the putting to use your knowledge, develop self-control. What does develop mean? To grow. 
So in putting to use knowledge, correct knowledge, the word of God, develop self-control. In exercising or putting to use self-control, develop steadfastness. Steadfastness, steadfastness means patience. In exercising patience, develop or grow in godliness. See, the key to obtaining any virtue is to grow in the knowledge you're exercising. So if you're not exercising knowledge, you won't obtain self-control. If you're not putting to you self-control, you will not grow in patience. Now, what I think is... um, How many of you, you got the revelation about tithing and you started to tithe and then your finances went havoc? You learned tithing. You decided to exercise your faith in this principle, the knowledge, but your money didn't grow. In fact, the money was short, a bill came up, and now you got the enemy talking to your mind. See, you shouldn't have gave that money, right? Okay, so as much as this scripture is saying exercise put to use your knowledge you're going to grow in this other area realize the enemy is coming to get what you just learned okay but to grow in something means you can't do it one time so in mark 4 we read okay you could be a spectator the enemy gonna come steal what you got you could be a newbie i'm saved but i'm not sure i really believe everything that's in here Or you can be one who's been here for a minute and you start learning about tithing, you give, and now, like a thorn, it hurts. You cut it off and say, I'm not going to do that. You're not going to develop any virtue because you gave in to the affliction because it got hard. And why did the affliction come? Because you put to use the knowledge that you learned to grow an area, and now the enemy came to steal it. Are you going to be the one to let him choke hold it out? Or are you going to be the one that produces some 30, 60, or 100 fruit? The only way you're going to produce 30, 60, or 100 fruit is you have to exercise your knowledge and grow. Exercise your knowledge and grow. That should be a song. Exercise your knowledge and grow. You can't have self-control. See, we don't need to point people out what they're doing wrong. Their behavior is going to show themselves. Okay, if you acting ugly, you ain't got no knowledge. If you've been impatient, you have not grown in patience. I don't need to point that out to you. Your behavior speaks for itself. But you're not going to learn it one time. You have to nurture it. You have to nurture, like a rose bush or gardening. I don't have a good green thumb. Um, I kill everything I try to plant. So you got to stay in your zone. You know, I just coupon and shop that's what I do my coupons do grow they grow okay but you know you got to nurture your garden if you want a harvest you got to nurture it which means you can't go out there and fiddle with it once you got to do it more than once so you can't grow in these things by reading one scripture I came to church one time you know I prayed with my friend yesterday well today's new problems okay All right, so verse 7. And you know what's interesting is when you're patient, you remain godly. That's why the scripture says don't don't give to useless talk because it only grows to ungodliness. And so the very person you're trying to minister to, you just look like a hypocrite because you're getting so impatient, now you're becoming ungodly. So that's why the scripture says don't have those conversations. Patience will keep us godly. Patience will keep us godly. Verse 7. In exercising or putting to use and applying godliness, we grow or develop brotherly affection. In exercising or putting to use brotherly affection, we develop in what? Christian love. Now, this scripture right here, this right here, convicted me of something. Radical. Want me to tell you? Why do we have an expectation for everybody to walk in love? 
we say walk in love, just walk in love, just walk in love. Well, you can't just walk in love if you don't know correct knowledge that you can exercise to grow in patience to exercise, to grow in godliness to exercise, to grow in brotherly affection to exercise, to grow in God's love. Why are we expecting people to walk in love when they don't know the knowledge of walking in love? Yes, God's love will cover a multitude of sins. But if you don't know it, why do we as Christians get offended because someone's not walking in love? First of all, us being offended, we not walking in love because love takes no offense. But if you're offended, that means... You haven't grown in the word to know you're not supposed to be offended. Which means you got to exercise what you know. So if you don't know it, what you got to do? Study the truth. So see, the scripture says, Jesus said in Mark, he said, the measure that you study the truth, study the truth, will be the measure of virtue and knowledge comes that comes back. Pastor Lori nobody's a perfectionist, but she was pretty close to perfecting that love walk because that's what she knew. She studied her love walk. The reason why it was so big was because the measure of which she studied her love walk. Now, you know why she studied her love walk? Because she wasn't always loving. Seriously. So we have to give each other grace because I might have an issue with patience, which means I'm probably going to spend all of my time studying out a measure of patience, which means I'll probably have more patience than you. But you may be studying stewardship or self-control, and I may not be able to resist eating chocolate cake, but you can, because that's your measure of what you've been studying. We need to quit getting offended because people can't walk in love. They can't walk in love if they don't know God. They can't, even if they come to know God, they're still not going to know how to walk in love until they study the truth. Until they study the truth. When we pursue God's truth, we get correct knowledge. When we get correct knowledge, we get virtue. When we get virtue, we get patience. When we get patience, we get godliness. And when we walk in godliness, we walk in love. So you're walking through a trial. Why is it that you're not walking in virtue? Because you're giving more study and thought to your trial than you are to the truth. Because there's a virtue for every trial. But if you're not studying that virtue, that knowledge, you're not going to bear the 30, 60, or 100 fruit. You're going to be like the one who touches a thorn and cuts it off because it's too hard. If you have ears to hear, hear. Now, you know, we're quick to say, I'm a child of God and I can just have it. Well, as a church, we need to not be content with fire insurance because that's all salvation is. Salvation is fire insurance to keep you from hell. It'll keep you from hell, but you're not going to bear no fruit here on earth. You're still going to be miserable. You're still going to be anxious. You're still going to have an attitude. You're still not going to have no friends. Seriously. If you want more, then you have to study who you are. Even if, okay, let me give you this example. If I have a relative that dies and they leave me an inheritance, just because I'm an heir, in order to get that inheritance, there's something I have to do. So the person that leaves an inheritance will usually leave a will or a trust. And in that will or in trust are the instructions of what I would get. I would read that information, figure out, if you're going to get some money, you're going to figure out what you need to do, right? Okay? So then whatever it says you need to do, you're going to go do it. Then you're going to take it to the bank. The bank's not going to just take your word. What's the bank going to do? They're going to read it too, figure out the instructions. They're going to abide by the instructions. Well, you are an heir of Christ. Okay? So you need to... Find out your inheritance, the correct truth, the correct knowledge. Read your instructions. 
figure out what they are and get what you're going to get, which is your promises. You're not going to get the promise unless you read the instructions. You're not going to get the instructions unless you get the document. Amen? So if you want to know, how am I going to get over this death? How am I going to get through this sickness? How am I going to pay this bill? Get your instructions, your correct knowledge. Get the instructions. What do I need to do? You know, people talk about, and obviously the the area of healing is what I was studying and, you know, um, trying to do all these things. We think we got to do all these things. I must have not. And, hey, I was there because of what people say, you know, Am I holding unforgiveness in my heart towards somebody? Is there resentment? Is there a sin that I didn't ask for? You know, I did all those things. I read a scripture that says, pleasant words is health to your bones. See, you just got to know your instructions. I was like, let me think. Have my words been pleasant? I'm seeking God for healing. So now I'm a little bit more cautious about, I'm not going to give too many people time to talk to me with negative words. Because pleasant words are healing to my bones. And I don't have time to be in pain. But I wouldn't know that unless I read the correct truth. See, you don't have because you don't know. Not what your mama did, what your daddy did, what your job won't let you do, what your husband did, what your kids did. You don't have because you don't know. You have to know the correct truth. Let's continue at verse 8. For as these qualities, meaning all of those virtues, patience, self-control, love, all these qualities are yours and increasingly abound in you. They will keep you from being idle or what? They will keep you from what? We want to bear fruit, don't we? What's our Bible confession? This is my Bible. God's speaking to me. What's the rest of it? This is my Bible. This is God speaking to me. My eyes are open. My heart is prepared to receive all of God's promises and instructions. Today I make my Bible the final authority in my life so that in every circumstance I will bear what? In what? Every circumstance. And what does every mean? Every. So that means if I'm broke, I'm bearing fruit. If I'm sick, I'm bearing fruit. If my husband left me, I'm bearing fruit. If my kids are acting up, I'm bearing fruit. If I come to church and nobody speaks to me, I'm bearing fruit. Not offended because nobody spoke to me. Because we don't know that person. They may not speak to you because they they're thinking about suicide. So you offended because they ain't speaking to you. And this person over here thinking about suicide. Ain't nobody over here thinking about suicide. And if you were, we would beat that in the name of Jesus. I'm just saying. I'm using that as an example. You don't ever know what someone's going through. Get out of yourself. Get out of yourself. You have no idea this person's barely hanging on, barely came to church just to get here, and you complaining because they didn't say hi? It took everything they had to get here. Then they're thinking, I don't even know why I came. I could stay at home for this. He says, these qualities are yours, and they will keep you from being idle. Do you, you feel stagnant sometimes? Like, I'm running this wheel, but I'm really not going nowhere. Well, if we keep our eye and measure on correct knowledge, we will have virtue. It will keep us from being idle. Because if we're, if we're meditating on God's word, okay, so st- take that, for instance, pleasant words are health to your bones. If you know somebody that's sick and you know that, you might try to do your part and speak pleasant words to them. It also talks about laughter is like medicine. Have a game night. Make them laugh. I'm telling you, from somebody who's walking through some health challenges, when we laugh and watch a good movie or have our family around and we're all laughing and having fun, there's no pain during that time. To do your part. So laughter. If someone isn't feeling well, that's not to say, I'm going to leave them alone because they're not feeling well. No, they need you. They need pleasant words. They need laughter. They need love. Remember, everything in the word is for you. Nothing is hidden. So he's saying all of these are for you, and they will keep you from being unfruitful. Now, just because it's going to keep you from being unfruitful doesn't mean you're not going to have affliction or persecution. You will still have, because the enemy, especially if you keep going, he's going to keep trying a little harder. 
He's going to come wherever he can come. And he's not going to stop until he stops you. Now, if you're unfruitful, there is a scripture that says if things aren't going well, you need to consider your ways. And we do need to consider our ways. If we're not giving and we're having financial problems, we need to ask ourselves, am I really honoring God with my finances? And I use finances as an example, not because we're a church that's about your money, but that's the problem that most people have. The, most of the, the needs that we get from the church are people who have financial needs. And it does not surprise us that the majority of the people that have financial needs are the people who do not give. And I'm not saying that to put anybody down. I'm just saying that if you learn to apply the word to your finances, you may see something different. You haven't been tithing. How has that been working for you? Are you rich? No. So maybe you should give it a try. And it's not about you being rich. It's about you having everything that you need. Sometimes it's not always money. I remember I went to pay a bill. We signed on to pay the bill. The bill was paid. I didn't pay it. It's not always about you having the money. It's about God supernaturally providing. But do you trust him with your money? But you want to complain because you don't have no money. You got money problems and you want to come to church and ask them to pay for your bills. But are you trusting God with your finances? That's just one area. That's the same thing. You know, you're sick, you got diabetes, you want insulin, you eat cake for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> Consider your ways. You can confess health scriptures all you want, but if you eat cake for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you have created the problem yourself. You have not developed self-control. Verse 9. For whoever lacks these qualities is blind, spiritually and short-sighted, seeing only what is near to him. So if, if you're going through something and you're not bearing fruit, that's because you are blind spiritually to the truth and you're only seeing what you're going through. You're not seeing the big picture. You're not seeing anything else. All you see is my need right here. This is miserable. My life is miserable. Nobody knows what I'm going through. I don't need you to pray for me. I don't need you to give me no scripture. I'm having a pity party and I just want you to know. <laughs> How many of you know people like that? Seriously. He says, so if you are lacking these qualities, if you are lacking fruit, 30, 60, 100, it could be 5% fruit. If you're lacking fruit, you're blind to the truth. Because the virtues are for everyone who has eyes to see or ears to hear. And the rest of, this, of that verse says, and has become oblivious to the fact that he was cleansed from his old sins. Sometimes we focus so much on our past, it prevents us from moving forward. It prevents us from our growth. We're talking about what I did, the sin I commit. Um, nobody's going to forgive me. I can't forgive myself. I'm so hurt from what my mother did 15 years ago. That's done. You have to move forward. And you will continue to stay stuck if you keep looking back. You know, uh, Norca and Victoria, come here for a second. So Norca is going to be, both of you stand in the, in the center. Norca is going to be God for the sake of the exercise. <laughs> for the sake of the exercise. And Victoria is just going to be a problem that you have. So I want you both to, and Victoria's not a problem. She's not a problem. She's beautiful. She's allowed being turned back to back. Okay, stick together. Now, Victoria's a problem. Norca's God. Look at both of them. Keep your eye on both of them. Now, both of you walk the other direction. Watch both of them. Can you watch both of them? Yes. Thank you, ladies. You can't watch God and the problem. You got to choose one or the other. So, if you want to bear fruit, you, you watch God. You're not bearing fruit, that's because you're looking at the problem. That's why you don't have anything. Then you want to come and ask us to help with your problem. Because you took your eye off of God. You took your eye off of God. What did Jesus do with the crowds? Those who want to know, I'm right here. You don't want to know, go figure it out. He said they'll look and they can't see. They'll hear and they're not going to understand. And they'll keep looking and they'll keep seeing and they're not going to understand until they want to understand. Sometimes we have to take the position that we are going to help you to see the truth and help you walk it out and be accountable to the truth. If we just hand out, hand out, hand out, 
You'll never learn. You'll never learn to depend on God. We can't save you. Verse 10. Because of this, brethren, be all the more solicitous. Solicitous. Whatever that word is, I had to look it up. I was like, what is this? That means be all the more attentive or mindful. So be all the more attentive or mindful and eager to make sure to ratify, strengthen, make steadfast your calling and election. For if you do this, you will never stumble. Remember in uh, Minister Erica's message, we're all called to be ministers of the gospel. Once we become saved, we're all reconciled to Christ. So you have to realize who you represent. So when you're walking around with no fruit, you represent God with no fruit. And God ain't no God with no fruit. That's why people look at us as Christians as hypocrites. I don't know what God used. I don't want that God. You broke, sick, disgusted. It says, if you do this, you will never stumble or fall. That's kind of a big statement, huh? It doesn't say you're not going to have affliction and persecution. It says you'll never stumble and fall if you do this. So even if the devil is knocking on your door, if you stay and focus on God, the knowledge you won't stumble or fall. So let me give you an example. When stuff gets difficult and you give up, when stuff gets difficult, that's an affliction or a persecution. And it gets too hard for you to bear and you no longer have self-control and you don't have the patience to endure. You give up, you've stumbled and fall. If you hold on to the truth and the knowledge, you won't stumble and fall. But it does not say you won't have affliction or persecution the key to not falling prey to the affliction or the persecution is to not fall and the way you don't fall is focus on the truth now I'm going to give you an example of this when Pastor Andre and I were first married in May it will be 15 years which is a miracle in itself and uh, amen yes it is Mm -hmm. and um, the first couple years I was ready to call it quits and I was more ready to call it quits than Pastor Andre was but anyway so we sought help from Pastor Ed and Lori we sought help because we knew we didn't know the truth obviously because if we did we wouldn't have the problems we had in our marriage so we sought a couple who was bearing fruit in their marriage okay so if we would have gave up and said this is too hard because I was already on that page I already figured out how I was going to live as a single mother you know I threw that been there done that I could do this I'd already thought how I was going to make this work and but we went and sought counsel now just imagine if we would have gave up we would not be here preaching we would not be here preaching see the enemy wasn't after our marriage he was after today so we didn't give up we said we don't know so let's go find someone who knows not let's go find a friend who's gonna say girl yeah leave him I would (laughs) no we went and sought somebody who had some fruit But you know what? It wasn't about seeking someone who had fruit. It was about seeking someone who had fruit, and we welcomed it, we accepted it, and we received it. We exercised what we were taught, and we developed and grew in our marriage. Remember, the one where the word is sowed and they bear 30 or 60 or 100 fruit, is the one who welcomed the word, received the word, accepted the word. Do you welcome the word, receive the word, and accept the word? Do you receive discipleship and correction? Do you exercise it and grow from it? Or do you reject it? If you reject it, that's okay. That's a good place to start to say, you know what? I'm I'm not bearing fruit in my marriage. I'm not bearing fruit at work. I'm not bearing fruit with my kids. Why? Because I have not welcomed the word, received the word, and accepted the word. But I decide today that I want to. 
Everybody can. Not everybody will. But everybody can. Let's continue with verse 11. Thus there will be richly and abundantly provided for you entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I intend always to remind you about these things, although indeed you know them and are firm in the truth that you now hold. See, Peter is talking to the Christians who fell prey to the Roman Empire. And he's saying, I know you already know these things, but I'm reminding you. Many of you know these things. You know if I do the word, there will be results. But what happens? We get caught up in life and we just forget. Or we just, you know, get caught up in what we're doing. We just don't give Jesus no mind until next Sunday. Right? So Peter's saying, so nothing's changed 2,000 years ago. Ain't nothing changed. I'm just reminding you. That's what he's saying. That's why we have to read our Bible every day. Because we forget every day. Verse 13. I think it right, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by way of remembrance. Since I know that the laying aside of my body of mine will come speedily, as the Lord Jesus made clear to me. See, he's getting ready to die. That's why he's saying, Christians, listen up. This is what you need to do. For your virtue, for your knowledge, this is what you need to do. Moreover, I will diligently endeavor to see it that even after my departure, you may be able at times to call all these things to mind. This is why he wrote the letter. Verse 16. For we were not following clever devised stories when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Verse 17. For when he was invested with honor and glory from God the Father, and a voice was borne to him by the splendid majesty glory and the bright cloud that overshadowed him, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased and delighted. Verse 18. We actually heard this voice born out of heaven, for we're together with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word made firmer still. You will do well to pay close attention to it as a lamp shining in a dismal dark place until the day breaks through the morning stars. Remember last week when we read in Mark 4 about God's knowledge is not to be concealed. There's no use in having a flashlight without a battery. There's no use of having an invisible light. He's saying it would be worth you paying attention to know you get this? This is the light that shines us in the dark places because the world faces persecution and affliction. The world faces hurt, sickness, divorce, death. But to see you walk with light, even in those circumstances, but bearing fruit causes them to want what we have. And he's saying these aren't, these aren't just stories. These are things that actually happen. Verse 20 says, yet first you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of any personal or private or special interpretation. For no prophecy ever originated because some man willed it to do so. It never came by human impulse, but men spoke from God who were born along, moved and impelled by the Holy Spirit. If you have eyes to see, see. If you have ears to hear, hear. The Bible is not a book of fake stories. This is my Bible speaking to me. This is your Bible speaking to you of all the promises that you are entitled to. But you only find them if you study it. And whether or not you bear fruit or not, you bear 30, 60, or 100 will all depend on how much you study the Bible. Everyone can, not everyone will. But someone will. Will you be that someone that says, I want to bear fruit? If that is you, then I encourage you to don't be ignorant to the enemy's devices because if you make that commitment and you start to study the word, affliction and persecution will come. But if you know it, See, there's times where Pastor Andre and I used to argue and I used to look at him and say, I rebuke you, devil. Pastor Lori busted up when I told her that. <laughs> now, of course, that took a little growing because, you know, you look at your husband and say, I rebuke you, devil. You, woo, you better watch out. Somebody might backslap you. But because I knew the enemy was after us. And when he tried to get us in other places, our finances, just other things, when he couldn't get us, we weren't ignorant to that. When, when Pastor Ed and Lori died, it would have been easy to say we're done. 
we want it to be done. But as I was studying for Lori's uh, funeral service, the Lord convicted my heart. It's too easy to lay down. That's what the devil wants. To say, we're done. This is hard. But if we say we're done, guess who won? The enemy won. Death, where is your sting? They may be in heaven, but we keep going. We don't stop. So whatever you're dealing with, you know what? Be encouraged. You know why? If you're dealing with affliction or persecution right now, that means you know something. You know something. It don't matter. It could be a little bit, a little bit you know. The enemy trying real hard to get it. You have to decide. You going to stumble and fall and give in or keep going? Even if you only bear 30. Hey, I'll take 30. I'll take five. I won't bear any. And give me a grape. Give me a grape. Ron might make it into wine. I'll take it. We were, we were persecuted. You know, it's so funny. After this message, Andre and I were persecuted this week on our character. Both of us. Two different people, two different scenarios just this week. Look what we preached on. And we had to decide we're not going to give in to useless conversation to try to make us appear ungodly. You have to decide. You have to decide.